Ho Tip, and welcome once again to another edition of Community Cop. My name is Noel Leader, one of the co founder members of 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care. This is where truth and real talk occurs. I'm here again, once again, with my three co hosts. First of all, Julian Harper. Welcome, welcome. Second of all, Michael Graves, AKA Big Mike. Namaste. And of course, the great father, Lucas. Ho Tip. And we'd like to welcome you, our viewing audience, once again, sit back in what we hope to be a very informative. Uh, uh, program and to remind you those who want to watch the program can watch it over the internet via Manhattan Neighborhood Network.org but right off the bat as is customary with Community Cop we like to reflect on the great um, uh, ancestor Nat Turner uh, is his birthday this month and Nat Turner was was a preacher who was given a divine vision that he should uproot um, and, and organize the slaves in order to to free themselves, uh, Michael, we'll start with you. Um, I very rarely, if ever, remember in school my teachers telling me about this great individual, Nat Turner. What are some of your reflections on Nat Turner? Well, certainly uh, your experience is not unique. Um, that's sort of the narrative that basically it, the entire black community would, would more or less go with you on. Um, we have been taught very little, if anything, about Nat Turner. Certainly, if anything, we're told that, that he was an outlaw and a criminal or that he was a crazed individual that had mental problems uh, simply because he wanted to uproot and stop the uh, institution of slavery. Uh, Nat Turner was a very spiritual uh, person, uh, one who loved our people, and um, he opened up his eyes to God, and God put it on his heart to... Um, end and challenge slavery at its core. You know, there was some symbolisms of uh, spiritual beings um, and certain things and uneven yoke. There were certain things in his life that he saw that gave him the communication from God itself. God wrote it on his heart to challenge slavery. And when he uh, took up that challenge, uh, he uh, held no, um, there was no uh, fee and trepidation and um, everything was on the table and he did uh, what, you know, real revolutionary does. He uh, uh, killed as many uh, of the slave masters and their families and other slave masters and their families that he did in Roots of Freedom and came within um, several votes of the uh, Virginia legislature of ending slavery um, in Virginia as we knew it. Uh, he was just that dynamic. And over that course of time, um, certainly there were Uncle Toms who was giving um, information along the way, but that's to be expected and um but he put up a, a marvelous fight and that's what we need to get from this he put up a marvelous fight and uh we should be proud and and um it's bad that things are not named after nat turner some of our people fear to this very day even mentioning and speaking about nat turner because they know it would open up the wrath of white so uh at this is a good time for always on his birthday to honor the great work of a uh, revolutionary and uh, preacher um, nat turner you know, it, it's, it's important that, as we always talk about on this show, that we have an opportunity to tell our story. And as Mike and Noel um, put it, um, it's very seldom, rare, and if ever in uh, the public schools in this country did you hear about Nat Turner. Um, I know I didn't uh, learn about Nat Turner through the uh, conventional educational system in this uh, country. Um, I learned through my own studies and uh, being around people that are like mine and concerned about the issues that affect our community. But, um, you know, we have to look at Nat Turner as a hero because in his heart, as Mike said, through, um, through the, uh, the spiritual um, being that he was, he felt that it was important, he was compelled um, to do the work that was needed to free our people. Um, and he did what anyone, I think, would do under those circumstances or any group of people would uh, do under those circumstances is fight for their freedom and their lives. And if that meant killing the people that were enslaving you, people that were um, oppressing you, um, that's what you have to do and that's what he did. And again, I think it's important that we do tell our story and we make sure that our story is told to our children. They understand that the, the works that were put forth to uh, free African people at that time. Well, I, I think it's been well covered. It's just not surprising that, like the Lord, he was betrayed by some of his own, or who we would consider to be some of his own. 
Right. All right. So on behalf of Community Cop, Nat Turner, um, you should tell your children, your grandchildren, as well as inform yourself about Nat Turner. Uh, one of the things that I remember my mostly white teachers telling me is that there was no resistance as it relates to slavery that Africans just laid down. Um, but uh, both on the continent of Africa as well as in America, there was hundreds of Nat Turners. There was hundreds of attempts of individuals to free themselves. Uh, so it's not as if African people just laid down and accepted their condition, or all African people. Uh, but Nat Turner, um, do your history check. Uh, as it relates to our topics today, first topic, this Wednesday is the, which is tomorrow, the presidential debates between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. Uh, the Republican Party, including Mitt Romney, has attempted to downplay the significance of these debates by saying it's not really a win or lose. It's not really important who wins or lose. I think this is because they understand the exceptional oratory as well as intellectual skills that Barack Obama too possess. Uh, Father uh, Lucas, we'll start with you. What is your, um, how significant do you think these debates are? Some people are stating that it's win or lose for Mitt Romney. Uh, he's fallen so far behind the polls. He had so many gaffes over the last couple of weeks that he really needs these debates to boost his ratings. What are some of your, your feelings on that? I really don't think <clears throat> this, these particular debates with uh, Obama and uh, Romney are going to be particularly important. I think folks have their minds made up already. Uh, the white males, for example, it seems that in spite of the fact that Obama has done precious little for black folks and has done almost everything for them, especially rich white folks, uh, the racism uh, that is blinding them, they will probably simply because in spite of Obama being so helpful to us, we just don't like the idea of a black face in the White House that doesn't have a mop and a pail in his hand. But I think their minds are made up already. I don't think this debate is going to one way or the other. Well, uh, as of this moment, certainly um, President Obama is leading in the polls. However, uh, that's not a luxury that he has to lay back. Uh, I think that uh, he has to win these debates. Now, as Noel pointed out, certainly his oratory, intellect, uh, far exceeds that of uh, Mitt Romney, um, who's um, a gaff, a gaff machine, <laughs> you know, in the true sense, and and lacks true ideas. He's just he has a a, a bunker mentality where he just gives you bunker sticker uh, praises, uh, phrases, and that's what he basically does. He they said he's um, he's prepped uh, with a lot of uh, bumper sticker uh, saying, so that's what he's gonna do. Zing! It's like uh, he's been taught by a zing master to just zing, zing, zing some cliche after cliche after cliche. That's basically what he's going to do. If you recall uh, when um, Bush 43 ran, he was on a tight uh, string to just deal with five or six things and not to not answer anything outside of those five or six things. President Obama does not have to worry about that. He basically can deal on whatever level uh, the questioner uh, wants to go. Uh, so uh, it'll do us proud in that sense to see a black man on the grand stage, obviously performing at the highest level, showing that he can outthink a, a white man who's vying for his job. And I think that's therapeutic. I think it's excellent. And it does our children well to see a black man where we've been taught we can't think, we don't have a, a or written history, we can't express ourselves and articulate. To see that black man articulate on the greatest stage, one can imagine um, is therapy for our children. Well, you know, I think that our people need to hear this debate. I think that there are people that are longing to uh, hear what uh, President Barack Obama has to say. Um, I, I, I listen to people in the, in the community who are really concerned about this election. I think people are, are, are fearful that um, things are going to get worse. Uh, if Mitt Romney does have the opportunity to be the president of this United States. And I think the people do have their ear to the television, to the media, and they want to hear what uh, President Barack Obama has to say. I think people are uh, a tad bit uh, nervous and concerned about the direction that this country is going in and that they do want to hear some kind of reinforcement verbally, you know, via the, um, the debates, that the president does have the concerns of the middle class, the masses, African people, they are looking to hear something during these debates that will either 
uh, assure them, reassure them, or give them some kind of hope that there's going to be something good that comes out of President Barack Obama being reelected? I kind of suspect that, uh, well, that may be true. People want to hear what he has to say. I think if we look for very recent past history, what Obama had to say in the last campaign had very little to do with what Obama actually did. And I don't know, I'm hoping beyond hope that this time it may be different, but I have no reason to believe it will be. Again, given his history, um, he should cruise through this election. Uh, he's laid his heart bare. He's um, done all the things for corporate America. He's bent over backwards for them. He has uh, saved the economy as we know it. He stabilized the stock markets. He stabilized the uh, auto industry. Um, uh, now the um, business as we know it is uh, uh, up again. Everything seems to be uh, working. Uh, more people now are being employed. Uh, that uh, The bleeding that was going on where people were losing their jobs at nauseam is no longer occurring. Uh, he has um, strengthened um, foreign policy always. Republicans have, have gone at the Democrats on foreign policy, on national security. This is um, one of the only elections I can think of in the last 20 or more years that the, 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 the uh, Democrat is not taking a back seat with respect to national security because he has been so hawkish and so heavy-handed with respect to uh, foreign countries. So. Um, this is um, one of the few times that uh, he can um, go lay back on his record, and he does. He's not going to appear weak when it comes to national security. Uh, Julian, um, the race uh, so, to some individuals is very close uh, because of the numerous gaffes that Mitt Romney had, especially over the last three weeks since the uh, end of the RNC. Do you think that if he does a poor job in articulating his positions, or if he's shown to be less competent than the Barack Obama in the position of president, do you think that this can hurt him? As you said, there's a core group of people that support Obama, support Romney, and they allege that there's a group of individuals in the middle. Um, do you think that a poor showing by Mitt Romney as it relates to his ability to articulate uh, what is he going to do as president of the United States, so some of the things that he's been avoiding thus far? Do you think if he does a poor job that this is going to devastate his campaign? Um, well. I believe it's going to have an effect on his campaign. Devastate is not the word that I would use. I don't think that it's going to be to that degree because I concur with Father Lucas. There are a, a group of individuals that are staunch in their support for uh, Mitt Romney, and there are groups of individuals that are staunch in their support for President Barack Obama. I think that there may be a few um, voters that are um, contemplating which way they're going to go, and I think that the debates may sway some to either A, to the side of um, Mitt Romney or to the side of President Bar Barack Obama. But I don't think it's going to be a large number where it will be devastating, but I think it will have some effect on his um, campaign. Okay, we will see. I don't think that Mitt Romney <laughs> can stand up next to somebody as intelligent as Barack Obama. And then he has the, the luxury of having been president, so he has the maturity in that position. <clears throat> so it will be interesting to see. That's tomorrow, so tune in. Issue number two, uh, Michael Gray's has been a historian uh, for Community Cop as it relates to Reconstruction and some of the political things that happened after the end of, of in chattel slavery in this country. The Republicans of late have been attempting to reintroduce voter suppression. Michael, we'll start with you on issue number two. A Pennsylvania judge has just ruled that the uh, ID requirements that the Republicans are attempting to introduce throughout the country is illegal and will not be enforced until after the election. Is that a win for the Democrats, or is it a win for so-called Americans? I would say that it's a win for the Democratic Party because 20 electoral votes in Electoral College is critical. And, you know, if the goal is, I think it's 271, uh, Pennsylvania represents almost, like, what, about 9 percent of that uh, total that President Obama needs. So 20 electoral votes is, is big time. And, and certainly uh, with the challenge he's made in the so-called swing states, uh, North Carolina's in play, and certain Confederate states are in play, and Ohio's in play, uh, even Colorado uh, seems to be purple at the moment. So um, uh, with all of these states in play, I think it's uh, 
good for the Democrats. If not, uh, the goal by the Republican Party was to remove 5,000 voting blacks from the, vo from, from the uh, voter rolls, uh, similar to what happened in Florida in um, 2000, was going to air its ugly head again nationwide. They have a plan, and the plan was to uh, disenfranchise uh, blacks. You have to remember, Romney's role is to get 60% of the white vote. Anything less than 60%, he's in trouble. If Obama um, goes into that 60% in any way, because they anticipated that if he gets anything over 40%, Mitt Romney is in trouble. So as of now, he, he has an over 40% um, range with respect to that vote. So voter suppression in those 27 states that, that it's in play in, uh, if uh, they can trim that down somewhat, the Democratic Party, which it shouldn't be the Democratic Party, it should be the Justice Department, should be um, on top of this, then um, it'll sway in um, President Obama's uh, behalf. You know, I, I agree with Mike. Um, it is going to benefit the presidential election this time. Um, I think that be because the judge is stating that there's just not enough time for everyone to be able to get the identification that it will allow them to vote, that he's going to disallow it for this election. Um, long term, it's not going to have an effect unless the Supreme Court decides that it's uh, not apropos for them to allow uh, them to get the, or the need to get the, the ID. But right now, just because there isn't enough time for this particular election, the judge is saying, listen, we're not going to allow it, but it may be imposed uh, later on, or it will be imposed later on as it stands. I agree with Mike and Julian about it's going to help the Democratic Party, but I also think it's going to help uh, the facade that we call democracy, that the uh, ability to deny people of their right to vote. And I, so that while the Democratic Party is going to be the great beneficiary, I think everybody in the state of Pennsylvania who has any interest in voting is going to benefit from this too. But, uh, you know, Mike, I want to go back to you, but why are we talking about voter suppression in 2012? I mean, we, those of us who, who understand the Reconstruction and understand uh, what was done to African Americans who, who achieved a little political success, you know, years after the Civil War, and we know what happened in terms of from the white, especially in the South, but even mm -hmm. in the North, to try to bring down the, the blacks that were able to vote. Why are we talking about this in 2000, 2012? Well, the reason we're talking about it, and, and unfortunately, there's a slant where we're using terms like the Republican Party. Whites have systematically always dealt in voter suppression. It wasn't a Democrat or a Republican that stood in front of the voting booth with the shotgun and coveralls on and, and dared any black person to walk up to that voting booth in Mississippi. We didn't care whether they was Republican or Democrat. The people who were running were all white anyway. We wanted to exercise that right to vote. We, we had, we've had to go through poll taxes where they claim they, we had to pay to pay the, the, the employees that worked there in the voting, the whole system of electoral politics. We've had to go through how many bubbles are in a bar of soap. We had to be able to recite parts of the Constitution. We've had to recite every living president from Washington to the president. All these things that they don't even do, whites. We've had literary, liter, literacy tests at, uh, at the voting booth where they gave black folks tests, but those dumb white farmers and, and the, the, that like, they didn't test them or they wouldn't have been able to vote. So this is not a Democrat or Republican thing. You gotta remember, historically, the Democratic Party is the party of states' rights, and that's a cold word for white supremacy. So it's not totally a Republican thing. Right now, the Democrats need the uh, black votes to sustain their level of um, control in Washington and, and so on. So President Obama is trying to get 45% of the white vote. If he does, Mitt Romney is dead if he gets 45%. So right now, Mitt Romney is looking at a 40-60 split. That's what he's trying to get. Anything Obama does over 40%, if he gets to 45%, Mitt Romney is history. All right, all right. And as it relates to voter suppression, you know, none of us are against, or no one is against 
people um, sometimes having to prove that they're the individuals that they claim to be when they vote. But these voter suppression laws and these ID laws are far more stringent in terms of the type of identification that some voters have to have. And we see it as a ploy uh, by, by the Republican Party to decrease the numbers that, uh, uh, that actually can vote or do vote. Uh, Father? Yeah, well, you know, as you say, why are we talking about it in 2012? Uh, the reason is that uh, once the so-called right to vote was given to black folks, it's been suppressed all from that time right. all the way down. It has just continued. This is just a new way in order to keep the poll tax and whatever you say going. Right. And uh, even the excuse that uh, the wrong people voting, they couldn't come up when challenged, they couldn't come up with one case of somebody voting who was not who he or she claimed to be. Mm. So the whole thing is a farce. And to show the contradiction, yeah. um, recently the Republican Party was, was had to pull back their support for an organization that was doing the same thing, I think in Florida uh, recently, right. that they had to pull back their support, that the people that they were financing was engaged in this, uh, the it same It was supposed to be a not-for-profit. Right. Even right. in a daily machine way back then, uh, they didn't have folks claiming to be who they weren't. They were just having dead folks voting. Mm -hmm. okay. And and even these these 27 states, they have gone back over 20 some odd years, and they and that and at the over 20 some odd years, countless elections, they've only been able to come up with one or two statewide. You know, we're talking about millions of people in each state, and we're talking about over 20, 30 year period. A few states, Florida came up with one or two incidents. Uh, Pennsylvania tried to use that video of two Black Panthers uh, during the Bush administration, during the uh, Bush 43's administration, to try to get something out of that. But even the Bush Justice Department said that uh, it wasn't um, any type of voter uh, violation um, in that situation. Okay, so the need for this stringent rules as it relates to voter, uh, voter ID is really unnecessary. Come a local, the fire department in particularly the Vulcan Society, which is a fraternity of black fire officers, had filed numerous lawsuits against the cities due to their hiring practices and the lack of black representations into the New York City uh, Fire Department. A judge recently ruled and okay the implementation of a latest exam, which the Fire Department is now saying is the most diverse list. It's unfortunate that uh, the Vulcan Society had to go to court and that the Bloomberg administration in the present fire commissioner couldn't diversify the, the fire department on their own. Uh, Julian, we'll start with you. Uh, first of all, the Vulcan Society, the Black Fraternity of Fire Officers, ought to get big kudos for their victory against Mayor Bloomberg, some of whom you supported out there. Um, uh, are we going to see this actually materialize into a more diverse fire department, which is one of the most segregated uh, uh, um, agencies in New York City? Well, that, that is yet to be seen, if we're going to see that. Um, it is definitely a um, positive and a, um, a, a win for the uh, Vulcan Society, and we definitely give them uh, applause for their work because they fought so hard and diligently to get For many done. years. For many years. And there's been numerous, numerous young African men and women who attempted to become firefighters. That's right. And they have not had an opportunity to, to receive that, that, that position. Um, to this day. And unfortunately, they're not going to be able to get it because I know some personally that have taken the exam and it scored extremely well. And unfortunately, they didn't get an opportunity to become firefighters. But um, with the work that has been done, we definitely give them kudos for what they've done. Um, we, can, we support you. Continue to fight because I think it's gonna, still going to be a lot of uh, uphill battle dealing with this racist mayor and this racist um, administration that really isn't looking to uh, include African people and minorities in, in their fire department, which they believe is their fire department. So um, just keep up the work and we definitely support you. Well, the Vulcans uh, certainly deserve a great deal of credit. In fact, they're not letting it stand where it is now because they're involved in a fight that those people who had been unfairly denied the opportunity should be in the past, should be given uh, raised up in their position on this list rather than the new ones coming in and also looking that they may sh be entitled to back pay mm. for the time when they were unfairly prevented from becoming firefighters. Mm. Well, it's, it's no doubt about it that first uh, uh, I, I joined with everyone else in saluting our fraternal brothers. Um, 
the Vulcan Society, uh, they have been uh, above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, we love our brothers and respect their work. Going back to uh, their years from the 70s, uh, when they fought strong and hard to establish uh, their fraternal order uh, to this very present day, certainly past president, uh, Paul Washington, a, a friend and brother to, to a community cop and 100 blacks in law enforcement, and, and the present president, I, I forgot his name, uh, certainly they're standing strong. They took the Bloomberg administration to court in 2007 when he overturned the test that had the largest amount of black firefighters ever, and they, they passed it. Uh, he refused that. They took him to court again. He fought that. And um, so two lawsuits, federal lawsuits, that the Bloomberg uh, administration refuses to allow. So right now, this federal judge is sitting on this test. Listen, um, supposed to um, today decide what he's going to do. And it was interesting to see outside of federal court yesterday, you had on one hand two groups. You had uh, the Vulcan Society with uh, aspiring um, firefighters. But on the other side, you had white firefighters that are currently on the job fighting to keep those blacks on that list from getting the job. So what, 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 is, what statement, what signal are they sending when you have white firefighters that have the job rejecting a list where they should just be fighting fires, minding their business. They are rejecting the potential list that might bring on more black firefighters than, than it's ever been in, in um, fire department history. So that only shows you just how uh, the, the racist, the, the blatant racism that exists within the fire department. And never forget that the current union president of the fire department, he came to fame by rejecting a photo that had a black, a white, and a Latino holding up a flag, a scarred flag that came from the ashes of 9-11. The city was going to, to, to do that, but this guy who was came from obscurity. He was unknown, an unknown little bum that came up and rejected that when the fire department was silent on it, police department, everybody silent on it, the mayor silent on it. And so when it was suggested to do that, to show white, black, and Latino were fighting together in 9-11, the white firefighters re rejected it. And, and, and the current um, guy, and I'm, I'm sorry, I can't tell you his name right now, he led the charge and became the president of that union, which is emblematic of the racism, the white supremacist attitude in the fire department. They took a guy from relative obscurity and made him their president because he fought to make that picture all white, not bl white, black, and Latino. Mm. All right, leaving from the fire department to the Board of Education, uh, this week a revelation was put forward and some parents are challenging the current practice and, and it's been the practice of a number of years of the Board of Education to give exams in order for students to enter it into these elitist specialized schools. Uh, when examination was done at these schools, you find that there was no racial diversity in these schools as well. Of course, the position of the mayor and the Board of Education is that, listen, you have to pass an exam in order to get in. But I've seen it and always have seen it in the past as a way for the few whites and that do attend public education to have a separate elitist uh, schools reserved for themselves and others. Uh, Father, we'll start with you. Um, were you surprised and do you accept the notion that this is a fair way uh, for students to enter into these specialized uh, elitist schools? I'm not surprised, uh, number one. <laughs> the secondly, it's obviously not only not a fair way, but it is designed to keep people of color out of those schools. So the, again, like the charter uh, of the thing and so forth and so on, it is an opportunity of uh, limiting public education to uh, people of color where they're not being educated at all, and in effect, create private elite schools for white folks. Um, uh, Julian, um, we talked about on this program uh, over a year ago that New York City Police, the New York City Board of Education is one of the most segregated educational systems in the entire country. 
How is this possible with liberal, so-called liberal, so-called progressive, uh, uh, forward moving New York City? How is it that New York City, and uh, I said we, one day we're going to have a program uh, about the myth of the white liberal, um, how is it possible for New York City to have the most segregated school department in the entire country? And yeah. I'm including Mississippi mm -hmm. and South Carolina mm -hmm. and Alabama and all them so-called su southern states as well. Well, you answered your own question. You talk about that myth. Mm. Of, of, of these uh, white liberals. Um, you know, New York City is, is very segregated, whether it's in its school system, whether it's in its um, political system, whether it's in its uh, any system. But you have to realize it's not just a physical seg segregation. There is a psychological segregation. There is a segregation of the way that it operates. It is se uh, segregated in, in its mindset. There are white supremacists, thoughts, positions, and um, ideals all throughout all of these systems. So as long as they function in that manner, we have to be clear that the effects, the results, are going to be one of the goals of white supremacy. So we shouldn't be surprised when we look at a segregated school system, when we look at a school system that's failing African children and Latino children. It is designed that way. And until we start holding our elected officials, black, Latino, um, Asian, accountable to ensure that their constituents are receiving what's needed to ensure that our children are being fairly educated, that our children and our adults are being fairly employed, and everything else that's needed and requested by our elected officials are being done, we are going to continuously be in the position that we're in because they continuously us. Uh, Michael, Julian and I both spoke about the segregation that exists, and I want you to answer the Board of Education question. Mm -hmm. But Julian brought up politics. Now, when Governor Cuomo ran, there was not one black uh, that was on his ticket, statewide ticket. Not only did, did blacks not have a problem, but whites didn't have a problem with that. When you look at New York City, there's not one black elected official elected to, to citywide office. In 2012, I think that's preposterous. So as Julian just added, we can talk about the Board of Education, talk about the fire department, talk about the police department, talk about politics. Segregation is the order of the day in New York City. Progressive, liberal New York City. Well, I, I think you're right. Now, now, Julian nailed it when he talked about the school system. Now, what you're talking about suggests that this is higher than the Board of Education. Now, uh, that's a, a slippery slope if you're suggesting that, Noel, because <laughs> what you're suggesting is that there's a, um, uh, a hierarchy within that where segregation is in politics and the highest level of politics. Obviously, the governor is the highest executive in the state, and you're saying that he has a slate. He brought an entire slew of candidates that ran under his ticket, and then you're suggesting that they were all white. And um, that couldn't be so because I didn't read that his entire slate was all white mm. in the Daily News or um, in the Times that says all the news is fit to print. And by the way, you know, it was the Times that went after Adam Clayton Powell. So they didn't say that. So I'm wondering if you're right or the Times mm. is right, Noel, because somebody's wrong here. Mm. So uh, for them to suggest that. But Julian nailed it when he talked about the preparation of our students. So I really don't have to say too much about it because he nailed it. The, the fact is, the reason why those tests are being passed by whites and Asians at a, uh, at a high number is because black students are not being prepared to take those exams. They have a, a shuttle system that by the fourth grade, they already decide how many prison cells they're going to have to build for blacks and Latinos based on your scores in the fourth grade. Uh, fast forward up to the eighth grade. You take that test for those specialized schools. Uh, in October of the eighth grade. So you're talking about you just got out of the seventh grade, you've been in the eighth grade less than a month, and now you have to take an exam for a specialized high school. This is skullduggery going on, it's draconian, because they're preparing in the seventh grade white students to take that exam to get into a specialized high school. And, and, and as Julian pointed out, black elected officials know that. 
that in the seventh grade there's no elected officials that are preparing, that have an institution in place to prepare seventh graders to take a school, to get to take the, uh, an exam for Stuyvesant and Brooklyn Tech and all these other schools that you see that's all white and, um, and Asian. So whites have a system in place. They have a set-aside program, even though they claim they're not, they're against set-asides. They have a set-aside program to keep whites on top and blacks in, in an inferior position. You know, it's rather interesting uh, that it's all, almost all white in a place like Stuyvesant, and yet still they not discovered the great cheating that is going on in mm -hmm. those schools in regard mm -hmm. to exams. But while Julian mentioned this, uh, quite appropriately, uh, you have to bear in mind that the bottom segregation is the economic segregation, right. which mm -hmm. all of exactly. this leads to. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that Bloomberg uh, refused to do is to to implement the 20 percent set aside. Only 20 percent for uh, black business to do uh, co get contracts from the city. He rejected that as Giuliani rejected it. It was the order today when Dinkins was mayor, but really Giuliani got rid of it. And when it's brought up to Bloomberg, who many of you voted for, uh, he also rejected that. So now we have blacks getting less city contracts now than under Giuliani, which is preposterous. Listen, brothers and sisters, racism and white supremacy is the order of the day in New York City and the state of New York, and that's highly unfortunate. And our elected officials, our clergy, haven't even developed the defense uh, for our people. But we have to do our phone callers. First caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Harlem. You're on the air, caller. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum, brother. All right, caller, uh, you're on the air. Brother, y'all need... Yeah, okay, I mean, uh, next Jamal, caller. Uh, Welcome to Community I Cop. I see our phones, uh, uh, lines are filled. Gray. Where are you calling from, caller? I'm from Harlem. Okay, okay hold up. I wrote to brother, 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 brother Mark, uh, Michael Gray about the ballot and the bullet, right? Yes, and sir. I asked him, could y'all possibly do a show on that? Because in the context of what we're going through, brother, we need to let our people know what's going on. This is a concerted effort against our people to attack our people, disenfranchise our people from uh, exercising our guaranteed rights. Also, the Viking brothers, the Viking society brothers, I give them all the kudos in the world. But brother, the same thing goes on, city and state, and your governor, Como, condones it. Bloomberg condones it. They're always talking about the Holocaust, but they never talk about the perpetuation of the Holocaust against black people. Mm. We need to wake up, come together, and move together to stop this. Peace. Well, okay. Peace. Thank you for your Peace call. Yes, sir. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Harlem. Okay, quick question or comment. I have a comment. Uh, you gentlemen made a reference to Nat Turner at the beginning of the show. Yes, sir, the great and Nat Turner. Michael, and Michael Graves had mentioned that uh, it's a shame that there is nothing named after Nat Turner. No, I don't well, think I happen to know that uh, about 40 years ago, um, there, was a, there was a music group formed in Virginia by the name of the Nat Turner Rebellion, and whose first single was uh, called chances. Tribute to a Slave. Uh -huh. uh, the oh, Nat Turner Rebellion uh, included uh, a gentleman by the name of Major Harris who went on with the Delphonic. So if you do search the archives and maybe the internet, you may be able to find that song called Tribute to a Slave. Right, okay. Uh, have a good evening, gentlemen, and, right. and keep up the good work. Right, okay. All right, thank uh, you, brother. Well, I think the brother's, the brother's right that in Virginia there are a few things named after uh, Nat Turner and a few sm few little small things. And they do have a parade and they have a, uh, an event named after Nat Turner that, that, that's yearly around the time of, uh, in August or something like that, around the time of uh, July, August, around the time of uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion. So he's right in that sense. But Nat Turner was so great that it shouldn't just be in little vestiges like in Virginia. It should be nationwide because he's one of the greatest black men we've ever produced. You know, oftentimes you hear black people saying that they would not uh, deal with slavery. They would uh, have fought it, but Nat Turner did it. You know, a lot of us talk about it. He lived it and did it and um, was very impactful on the state of Virginia. So uh, we should do more, and our children should know what a real great man. They should not put Negroes and Uncle Toms and buffoons and sellouts and make them heroes when we have real heroes in our history that need to be um, unleashed. All right, and I think there's also a Nat Turner school as well, uh, but the point is that there's not enough taught and told about Nat Turner, who was one of the greatest Americans 
in American history, him and John Brown. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm calling from Harlem. Okay, quick question or comment. Okay, now, this is what I'm saying now. As far as the presidency, why we keep talking about it, man, is because uh, they, they don't want to lose control. And that guy, Romney, how do you keep how do you, uh, practice and try to tell the people something you had already said and try to convince the people that you didn't mean what you already <laughs> said? Now, yeah. his, his policy, what is his policy? He has no policy. He thinks all blacks is all welfare, Medicaid and Medicare, and all that. So I'm saying as far as the school is concerned, they don't ever want to teach our kids the truth about our history because they've always been afraid of us, mm. and they always will be. Right. Okay. See, it's okay for the white kids to go hack into the machine and get the answers and hand it out to their friends, mm. and if they don't get busted, they don't get busted. It's all right. But once they get busted, then, oh, they got to, and they give them a second chance. Okay. All right. Excellent okay, point. Else. Go ahead, brother. Excellent Please. point. Thank you for your call, caller. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Manhattan. Okay, quick question or comment. I wanted to know to the whole panel, did y'all see where they made uh, that that racist cracker to kill Omar Edwards? Then he was promoted to sergeant the other day, and then they also gave Boss, the one that was involved in the Amadou Doyle shouting, shooting his gun back. I right. mean, I just wanted to hear what your comment is on that. Okay, excellent Have point. Have a good day, brothers. We actually had that down as our notes to cover, but we ran out of time. Uh, Commissioner Raymond Kelly, this is a man, uh, before all you ever saw, this is a man who, when he walked in African American Day Parade uh, not too long ago, a few Sundays ago in Harlem, he was greeted by many politicians because he showed up. He was greeted by many of our elected officials. Uh, but as the caller stated, a uh, boss who was involved in the Amadou Diallo murder, um, was recently uh, given his guns back. Now, uh, um, boss attorneys have filed a lawsuit with federal courts, state courts, and all the judges say well, they're going to leave it up to the police commissioner. So police commissioner Kelly was illegally compelled to return his gun, as well as uh, promoting the individual who murdered uh, Omar Edwards, another black cop. Uh, Julian, we start with you. What were some of your impressions of, of uh, Commissioner Kelly? This is, this is routine for Kelly. You know, what do you feel about the uh, return of his weapons? Now, Boss has a gun, and he may be able to retire, excuse me, soon, so he's going to be able to carry his weapon, most likely, even when he leaves the job, because, you know, his tenure should be close to 20 years since this happened 13 years ago. I mean, I'm not surprised. You know, Raymond Kelly operates as Raymond Kelly does, so I don't think that we should be surprised that he allowed this to happen. I think that we should be um, surprised that our community has such a... Um, short memory that we forget um, when things like this happen in our community and allow a Raymond Kelly to go unscathed, unchallenged, un, um, uh, 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 criticized, criticized and, 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 and bashed for what he's done um, in allowing these officers to either A, be promoted and B, have the ability to carry a gun in our community where he's around our children and our adults carrying a firearm. We really have to start holding Raymond Kelly accountable as opposed to giving him praises when he comes in our community. But as far as being surprised, this is not um, something that's uh, not the norm when it comes to the way uh, Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly operates. I consider the folks who ran the African, so-called African American Day Parade the same as Noble who uh, gave Kelly an award the Noble and, being a national organization of black law enforcement executives. Right. And to the fact that they allowed Kelly to march in an African day parade uh, mm. shows you that we have problems, that we have serious problems in the black community. And folks, some folks out there cheering, the, uh, uh, cheering him. Wow. Well, I, I think that this clearly is emblematic of an administration that's run by Raymond Kelly. First of all, uh, uh, Kenneth Boss, who uh, was one of the shooters in the um, Amnu Diallo, that wasn't his first one. He killed a young man in the 75 precinct. Uh, this young man was complaining about drug dealers, dealing drugs right in front of his building. I'm trying to remember the name. It starts with an R. He um, killed him, uh, and then he joined the street crime unit after that and um, continued his killing ways. So uh, certainly not surprised that uh, he, he uh, received his gun back. Even though we have black officers, and I wish Eric Joji was here, he can do a rundown of black cops 
who haven't done anything nearly as bad, and yet they don't have their weapons. And then uh, look at um, what happened to Amnul Diallo. I mean, look at what happened to um, Omar Edwards. Uh, he was shot and killed by Dutton, a low life, no good cop, a dirty cop who shot him in the back and lied. And, um, and not only did Raymond Kelly know the lie, he joined in the lie and claimed that Omar Edwards was shot in his chest. The mayor said that it, race was not involved. This is all prior to an investigation the very next morning. So 100 blacks in law enforcement will not forget Raymond Kelly and will not forget Bloomberg for their lies and killing a two-year veteran black cop, which shows you black cops mean nothing to the police department. They're nothing but a number. All right, next caller. Welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Hey, I'm calling from Brooklyn. This is Clarence. Okay. This is Clarence from Brooklyn. Okay, quick oh. question and comment, brother. Hey, listen, uh, that brother who was killed in Brooklyn uh, by the boss, his name was Patrick Bailey. Mm -hmm. Pat, that's his name. Right. Yes, the sir. Mother, Patrick that's Bailey. The mother Patrick told Bailey. Uh, D.A. Charles Hines, who does not send cops, uh, put cops away, told, Patrick, uh, told D.A. Hines to get that cop off the, off the beat, off the streets, because he's going to kill again. Charles Hines didn't listen. That cop That's correct. The, Bronx. the biggest shooter of Amadou Diallo was Officer Boss. Wow. Mm. Yes, All right. right. All right, thank you for your call. No, Sean O'Carroll shot 650. Okay, next caller. Welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Hello? Yes, where are you calling from? Yes. I'm calling from I'm calling from the Bronx. Okay, turn your TV down, ma'am. Quick question to comment. Okay. Go. All right, yes. next caller. Okay, next call. I'm calling about the right. Right. Next caller, next caller, next caller. Come on, ma'am. Everybody have to turn your TV down. We're running out of time. We've got a lot of callers. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Harlem. Okay, quick question or comment? Comment. Go ahead. All right. Um, I just want to say that I find it appalling that the African American Day Parade would, uh, would allow our kids to ride on the corrections bus. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the last place that our children should be on in that parade. That sends out a bad, that's a bad, you know, that sends out bad messages. Well, you know, you know, some, uh, excuse me, brother, sometimes those are family members of correction officers, you know that, right? Well, they shouldn't be putting their own kids on the bus. Well, are you people who work for the Department of Corrections? <laughs> excuse me? The people who work for the Department of Corrections shouldn't have their kids ride, ride the bus? I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't all right. There right. also might be um, what's the thing that uh, for yeah. police? The eagle. Yeah, like the, like the, little uh, programs. They have. Academy. Well, okay, yeah, officer. Right. I mean, uh, call. I'm sorry. Thank you for your call. Next caller. Welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Yes, I would like to speak about um, what you said about Nat Turner and okay. stuff like that. I think where are you calling from, caller? Where are you calling Nat from? Nat Turner. Because when you were talking about the fire department, um, about their racism, you're talking about their education. What we fail to realize is that we have war and war on different kinds of fronts. And so we need to, to like Elias Muhammad said, separation is a good idea. I understand that in terms of education, we need the, the financial funds because we take, you know, they take our taxes. But even if we did, was allowed to go to the elite schools and stuff like that. They, what are they going to teach us? The same nonsense they've been teaching us for years? Right. So All right, I, I think I, that, you know, we right, need to get together point. and you know, fight on all fronts and stuff politically. Okay, and we got it, brother. Is an idiot we stuff. got it, brother. We got it. Got an excellent point. Thank you for your call. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Next caller, Hello? where are you calling from, caller? Yes, I'm calling from the Bronx. Okay, quick question and or comment. I wanted to know nice. what you think about the rice that has arsenic in it. Uh, um, uh, it said that the, um, oh God, it has arsenic in it and that we should not give it to children and that it's going to uh, mess up our body. So I'm saying, what are we supposed to do with rice? now okay they said they charge 200 different brands okay all right we got, we got we got it we got it call um anybody well they, they you should avoid quick. it from that period but they've supposedly detailed which ones to buy what sectors of the country that uh rice was ill affected in so you have to go by what they've uh pointed out what areas to buy from and what areas you should reject rice from i think the look at the role of monsanto in regard to food and we're in bad way, not just arsenic and rice, but the so-called genetic engineering and all that stuff. We're not even allowed to know what's in our food these days. So the fact that the arsenic thing got out, 
it was going on for some time. Right. All right, thank you for that, that, good, that good phone call. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Yes, Hotel Brothers. I'm calling from Harlem. Okay, quick question to comment. Yeah, just quickly, uh, you all were talking about um, the fact that Cuomo didn't have any blacks on his, um, on his uh, you know, hierarchy of uh, people working under him. No, 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 and, no, 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 time out, 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 time out. When, when, I'm time, sorry? We said statewide ticket. It wasn't blacks on the statewide ticket. On the statewide ticket. Right. You know, where you, you know, Brother Graves was talking about the fact that it wasn't in the New York Times. It's, it's not shocking because they, they figured that it's not white supremacy, it's not racist. That's just the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> Whenever something benefits a black person in this city or country, it, they feel as though it's taking something away from white people. And just quickly, number two, uh -huh. um, I talked about this before. But until we are willing to make some sort of sacrifice, we could literally shut the city down. If we just pick one day, blacks and Latinos in this city, when we say we're not going to uh, support public transportation, just one day, right. we could literally right. shut this city down. Okay, until we got it. We got it. make a sacrifice, we got nothing it, will ever change. Okay, Thanks. we got it. Thank you for your call. Excellent point. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Where are you calling from, caller? Um, I'm calling from Harlem, New York. From, from where? Oh. Okay, quick question or comment. Quick question or comment. Hello, New York. Turn your TV down, brother. I think it's real stupid that the mayor would fill a... Turn your TV that down, brother. a Ferris wheel instead of affordable housing for... <laughs> All right, this call, you keep listening to yourself on the TV. Don't do that. Just talk to your phone. With people in New York. Right. Okay. Excellent point. Now, this this particular Ferris yeah. wheel, they say it's going to cost a couple of hundred million dollars. It's that now. Right. A father. Does this make sense? No, it doesn't. But uh, he's leaving a memorial to himself. Meantime, folks are living in the streets and in shelters. Right. The brother is right. And and uh, you know, one of the things, one of the problems I have, Julian. I know you were you were for the uh, the, uh, the Bloomberg getting the third term. <laughs> I'm just being comical. But what has Bloomberg done which warranted a third term? Would warrant him to, for him to ignore two referendums by the electoral uh, city citywide, the citywide uh, two referendums? What has he done in his third term? And mind you, many black uh, city council members who usurp the authority of the, the electorate, the voters, by supporting his. Um, overthrow of democracy in, this, in the city. What has he done? Julian, help me, please. Julian. Uh, well, see, the problem is that you're not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. When he, he's done what he m meant to do and what it was designed for him to do, to ensure that big business benefits from taxpayers' dollars in this city, uh -huh. to ensure that he doubles and triples his own financial uh, success mm -hmm. off the backs of his, off the back of, 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 uh, of uh, the citizens of of this city and his position as mayor. So he did what he, uh, what it was designed for him to do. We're looking for what we wanted him to do as a mayor, as a collective for the people that are the denizens and that reside in this city. That's not what his goal was. His goal was to make sure that big business prospered at the expense of the people of this city and that he continued to develop his own uh, of financial success at the expense of this city. So we, I think we were just looking in the wrong direction. He knew what he was doing. Uh, thank you, Julian, for clearing that up for well, me. Well, let, <laughs> <laughs> let me just say real quickly, uh, the Honorable uh, Michael Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg, did give us something. He gave us Dennis Walcott, a black chancellor, and this black chancellor has, has claimed that specialized schools is fair, the way they take the test for those schools. So I guess... Um, uh, if it's fair, then it's Walcott, and you can really say that with a straight face, then you really are, you really are God send the black folks. Mm. And I want to ask real quick before we go off, we only have a, a couple more minutes. There's a um, uh, Councilman Williams, Jermani Williams. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message that I should go to my phone call. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Call for the Okay, quick question of comment. Good. Comment, um, D12, I was on that bridge. When this happened, when we what had happened? A, we, uh, uh, we, we happened with uh, uh, Joseph Hawkins. Okay. All right. Now, what Father Lucas saying was correct. The police started swinging and broke the casket. I got my arm fractured in two different places. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, like I say, uh, um, what Father Lucas saying was uh, 100 percent correct. Right. Okay. And um, I, that helped. That helped things a lot. 
Well, okay, thank you, caller. Thank, um, thank you for your to. thank you for your call, caller. Next caller, welcome to Community Cop. Where are you calling from? Next caller, you on the air? All right, we have a problem with that call. Uh, let me let me go real quick to um, the Jamani Williams law. It's called the Community Safety Act, which. <laughs> like past laws has something to do with his attempt to address our question of frisk, which I know is, is really um, nonsensical. Um, well, one of the things that I'll just talk about this was really wanted down. They're calling for the establishment of an office of an inspector general who will over, oversee the New York City Police Department. But in this law, Mayor Bloomberg picks the inspector general, Ooh. Julian. <laughs> <laughs> is he picks a, now his pick for inspector general is going to oversee his pick for the police commissioner. Right. Listen, everything will be status quo. Nothing's going to change. Just today they reported that um, the New York City Police Department is putting together a new unit um, that's going to uh, address the gang issue in our community. They're going to add about 300 more police officers. You know, if they're going to do real investigation, and the problem is that we don't have a police commissioner that's going to ensure that the laws are being enforced accurately and fairly. So I don't care how many police officers you put out there to address these issues, it's really not going to affect us in a positive way that we want it to. So whatever Bloomberg is going to do, whoever he's going to appoint, is going to keep things status quo. All right, closing words. Um, reinstate automatics. Dad, I love you. Listen, politics are local. We really have to deal with these issues and hold our elected officials accountable. Uh, those who know the word of prayer, let's pray for a swift and full recovery for our great leader, uh, Lombe Brath, reinstate Alton Maddox. Reinstate Alton Maddox, certainly, but we got to fight on our hands. That's beyond. All right. On behalf of the community cop and our engineers, we like to say, see you next Tuesday. A little more, I love you. Thank you for Sierra, little Sierra, uh, uh, Veronica Kitt, Nat Woods, Sheila Berry, our engineers. See you next Tuesday. Thank you for watching. The general was in the house. Fight the power, knowledge is power, and yeah, reinstate Anthony. all matters. Oh, brother who? Anthony. Brother Anthony, little Mo, I love you. See you next Tuesday, 5 o'clock, Community Cop. Peace. Before the fiddlers have fled, before they ask us to pay the bill, and while we still have the chance, let's